So uh, welcome to the KDD tutorial on making better use of the crowd. Um, I am Jen Wartman Vaughn. I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research in New York City. Um, I want to start by giving you just a little bit of background on um, why I thought that this type of tutorial would be useful and interesting and um, what we're going to talk about today. Um, before I even get into that, we are a pretty small group here and this is a very long tutorial. So um, I'm happy for things to be kind of as interactive as you like. So please feel free to stop me at any time and ask questions. Um, we have plenty of time and I want to make sure that this is useful to all of you. So please interrupt, ask questions, anything you want. Um, good. So this is going to be the um, third iteration of this tutorial now. So this is something that um, I initially developed for NIPS last year, though it's changed a little bit since then. And um, my original motivation in putting together that tutorial was that um, you know, I would look around at how people were using crowdsourcing in the machine learning community. I think things are very similar um, in the data mining community. And um, I saw kind of two things that bothered me a little bit. So um, one of them was that, you know, there are all of these kind of tips and tricks that um, you actually need if you want to successfully use crowdsourcing in research, but none of these things are really written down in a nice way anywhere. So um, I wanted to have a chance to kind of talk to people about some of these things. Um, and the other is that when I looked around at how people, at least in the machine learning community, were using crowdsourcing in their work, um, it seemed like people were using it in a pretty narrow way, right? So um, the most common use is that people would um, use crowdsourcing in order to generate labels for data to run their algorithms on, which is a very natural thing to do. Um, the, I would also occasionally see people using crowdsourcing to evaluate their algorithms, but um, that was pretty much all the people in these communities were doing with crowdsourcing. And I think that there's a lot of really interesting work coming out um, in other parts of computer science, neither beyond, even beyond computer science, um, where... Oh, no. I didn't even realize that was a light, but thank you for pointing that out. Um, so weird. Yeah, so... Um, People in other parts of computer science and even beyond computer science were um, using crowdsourcing in kind of more interesting ways. And I thought that uh, the machine learning and data mining communities would really benefit from hearing about some of these other applications. You know, maybe these are not things that are going to be directly applicable in your own work tomorrow, but I hope that there are things that will kind of inspire people to um, think a little bit bigger and think more creatively about how you can use crowdsourcing. Um, so with that in mind, the, um, this tutorial is going to be broken into two halves. So um, the first part is going to be about um, better ways that we can make use of the crowd, and in particular, um, other problems that the crowd can solve beyond these um, typical examples of generating labeled data and evaluating algorithms. Um, although I'll talk about those a little bit too. Um, in particular, in this part, I'm, I've kind of broken these applications that I'm going to talk about down into three categories. So the first is um, direct applications to machine learning. Um, anywhere that I say machine learning here, you can interpret machine learning in the broadest sense. So this covers you know, things that people in data mining care about too, as well as natural language processing. And um, I'm kind of using machine learning as a blanket term here. Um, I'll then talk about a few examples of hybrid intelligence systems, which are um, systems that have both human components and machine components that are kind of working together. I'll also use this term rather broadly. Um, and finally, I will talk about a few examples of um, large-scale studies of human behavior. Um, this is an area where um, other communities, in particular the psychology community, um, are really taking advantage of crowdsourcing because crowdsourcing allows people to run um, user studies and experiments that are kind of much bigger than something that you could traditionally do in a lab. And I think there are a few interesting examples that I'll talk about of people um, taking advantage of this in computer science. And this is somewhere where I really think computer scientists could be taking advantage and doing a lot more. So this is what I'll cover in the first part, kind of a whirlwind tour of these applications. Um, in the second half of the tutorial, I'll get back to these kind of tips and tricks that I mentioned earlier. And um, in particular, I'll focus on the fact that people kind of 
think about crowdsourcing as a black box, right? So, you know, when you think about how people, you know, especially in machine learning, think about crowdsourcing, they think of having some data, like an image, they think about some labels that they want to get for this data, and they think about this crowd as being this kind of mysterious, nebulous black box that you just send your data to and out pops the labels that you want. Um, and there's been a lot of research recently um, that I'll, like some of which I'll talk about, that's focused on the fact that this crowd, when you actually open up this black box, is perhaps not surprisingly made of actual people. And I wanna argue that this matters if you're going to use crowdsourcing in your research. So we'll talk about um, questions like what motivates crowd workers? Um, are workers independent? Um, are workers honest? And so on. And um, throughout this whole section, we'll also ask um, what all of these research studies looking at kind of how crowd workers who crowd workers are and how they behave should teach us about how to effectively interact with the crowd and how to do better research with the crowd. Okay. And a lot of these boil down to the fact that, you know, we should just keep in mind that the crowd is made of people and treat them respectfully, be clear with them, be responsive and so on. Okay. So that's a um, basic summary of what we'll talk about today. Um, I just want to mention that there are um, extensive lecture notes that I put together for the first version of this tutorial, um, as well as slides and um, someday this video. These are all available um, on the website, which is also linked to from the KDD program. So um, if you're interested in any of this and want to go back and look at the notes, you can go look at that later. OK. And again, please feel free to interrupt me at any time, ask questions. Um, debate what I'm saying, whatever. I'm happy to have some open conversation. Uh, great. So with that, let's move on to part one, potential of crowdsourcing. And again, um, I'm going to give kind of a whirlwind tour of a bunch of different applications of crowdsourcing, different ways that crowdsourcing can be used in this half. And I'm going to start by talking about some direct applications to machine learning, starting with kind of the most basic and then getting into some slightly more interesting applications like um, debugging machine learning systems. So I'll start by just briefly talking about kind of the most very basic application of crowdsourcing and machine learning and data mining. And this is the idea of generating labeled data. I think this is the application people are probably most familiar with, and I'm not going to say anything that's too surprising here, but um, I feel like in any tutorial on crowdsourcing, this should be mentioned. So let me talk through what the basic scenario is. Um, so the scenario I have in mind here is we have some learner and some crowd. Um, this learner has data that he wants labeled, so say um, images in this case. I use images as an example a lot just because um, they make slides prettier. But, um, you know, this could be anything. This could be text. These could be, um, you know, medical images that we want labeled for a medical task, task, et cetera. So the learner sends this data to the crowd. The crowd um, sends back some labels for these. Maybe the crowd says that this image is a dog, this one is a cat. Um, because the crowd is often thought to be um, noisy, typically the learner won't just ask for one label, but will ask multiple workers for labels for um, each data point. So maybe the crowd will actually send back multiple labels, which may or may not agree with each other. Um, the learner will then aggregate these noisy labels in some way, and I'll talk about um, kind of the most common example of what people do here in a minute. Um, send these no noisy labels off to um, some algorithm, which will train a model. And um, typically at this point, the humans are kind of removed from the loop, and we're left with just this trained model that can take new data points and output its own labels. Right? So this is kind of a, a picture of um, how people use the crowd to generate data. And I just want to mention that you know, this has been used, this idea has been used um, really broadly in a lot of contexts. Um, this was kind of first um, popularized by Snow et al, who used it in the context of um, natural language processing, but it's been used since to annotate medical images, label text, um, extract features from scenes, um, label images quite frequently, and so on. And it's also inspired a huge amount of algorithmic work on this problem of how do we aggregate these noisy labels from a crowd. 
Um, so uh, we could have an entire you know, four hour long tutorial on just how to aggregate noisy labels from a crowd. I'm not going to do that here. I just want to mention um, kind of the, the earliest algorithm that people um, talk about a lot here, just as a simple example. And this is um, the EM-based algorithm of um, Dawid and Skeen. This goes back to 1979, but people are still using um, either exactly their algorithm or ideas based on their algorithm a lot. So um, it's a very simple idea. We can present it without going into any of the math or details. The idea is pretty easy. So here, um, they think about having as input these worker-generated labels for each instance. So we don't have, we have kind of a, a bunch of people in a crowd and a bunch of instances. And for every instance, you know, we can assume maybe we have a few labels, not from everybody, but from a few different people. And maybe from everybody in the, everybody in the crowd is labeled a few different images. We have some amount of overlap here. Um, so we have these labels. Um, as output, they would like to get kind of one aggregated label for every instance um, as accurately as possible. And the idea of this algorithm is pretty simple. So um, they start off by um, calculating an initial estimate for every instance's label by just taking a simple majority vote. So this is kind of the most straightforward thing that you could do. They just look at all of the labels that have been submitted for this instance and take the one that's the most popular. Um, and then they have this iterative process to improve on this. So in the first step of this process, they treat these current label estimates. So at first, these are going to be the majority vote estimates, but these will update over time. So they treat these as ground truth. And um, assuming that these labels are ground truth, they estimate some measure of every worker's quality. So um, I'm being a bit fuzzy on what quality is here. You could imagine plugging in all sorts of different things. But if you're thinking about um, just something like binary classification, this could just be something like the fraction of um, the instances that this worker labeled that they got correct, some measure of quality. Okay. Um, then, after they've done that, they kind of flip things around and treat these quality estimates as truth. And they then calculate the most likely label for each instance, assuming that these quality estimates are actually true. So they kind of use the fact that they have um, an estimate of how good every worker is to come up with something that's a little bit better than a majority vote for each label. And again, I'm being a little bit fuzzy on the details because there are many different ways that you can instantiate this, and people have instantiated this in many ways. Um, but the basic idea is just to repeat this um, iterative process of kind of pretending that the labels are correct and estimating quality, pretending that our quality estimates are correct and estimating labels, and repeating this until it converges. Um, so, you know, this is an EM style algorithm, so there are no guarantees on optimality here, but it tends to work pretty well in practice. And um, as I've said, there's been just a huge amount of work in the last few years of people um, kind of building on the model um, of Dawidinskine and building on this algorithm and coming up with variants that work for um, different variants of the crowdsourcing problem, like, um, you know, cases where um, different data points may have um, different difficulty levels, or you may have some gold standard tasks that you know the answer to, and so on. Um, good. So that is basically all that I'm going to say about the basic um, problem of generating labels for data. I just want to give like a, a very, very brief mention of this problem in the most basic algorithm here. So let's move on to um, a couple of different ways that you can use crowdsourcing for machine learning beyond this. Um, yes? Are these, are these algorithms ever used for machine learning as well? You have multiple algorithms that are producing large part of predictions. I mean, I've seen them in literature, just people take simple majorities, but it seems like you could use this algorithm as well in that situation. Yeah, somehow I haven't seen people do that as much, but there's no reason that you couldn't do that. And I'd be surprised if nobody had done it at some point. I'm just wondering what kind of Yeah, makes sense. Although I guess one, one slight difference here is that if you have um, machines, it may be the case that 
you actually have a little bit more information because with, with crowd workers, probably each worker is only labeled a small number of instances, whereas a machine could potentially label all of the instances. So you have a little bit more information there. But yeah. What happens when they cross the ground to uh, two, the, uh, two ground truths or something like that? Like they label something else? There are two different ground truths. Um, so that kind of. Um, yeah, so um, this kind of thing does come up a lot. I mean, this algorithm is not ideally suited for that because it will end up kind of just choosing one of these labels and then, you know, knocking down half of the people's quality just because they happen to choose the la bad label. So, um, I would say maybe you might want to use a different technique if you think that this is a common case in your data. It's probably not as big of a deal if it's something that's rare and unexpected, but certainly this could happen. Yes. Why can't you just skip those uh, when you are learning to classify or anything? That way you just learn all the other data. Um, skip. Like the skip the peer is a, like, which the user is not able to label as yes and no. So, you know, something like unsure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that kind of thing has been done. Again, I don't want to get too hung up on just this data labeling problem because that's not like the real focus. But um, people have looked at algorithms that allow people to say that they're unsure about certain instances and so on. And even using something simple like this, you could imagine, you know, just going in by hand afterwards and um, just kind of doing some sort of sanity check to make sure that there aren't instances where people are really split. Maybe, you know, maybe for the difficult cases like that, you want to look at it by hand. Yeah. Okay. Good. So let me talk about um, a slightly different problem, which is still kind of a data generation problem, but starting to get a little bit more interesting. And this is the problem of um, generating similarity measures, um, also known as crowd clustering. So um, the idea here is that you know, suppose we want to um, cluster a data set, such as, you know, a collection of images of politicians. Um, there's a huge literature out there on clustering. And if you kind of have the right features in place already, you have the right representation of your data, then there are machine algorithms that can do really well. But um, the idea of going to the crowd here is that it may be the case that the crowd kind of has in mind features that a machine may not have access to immediately, right? So you can imagine in this case, if you just give this to um, a clustering algorithm that um, is meant to work on simple visual features, then this algorithm might output something like this clustering, which is just simply based on the fact that, you know, these are images that are found to have flags in the background. These are images that are found to have no flags in the background. When, you know, if you show these to a human, this is probably not the first thing they would come up with. They would use um, their own domain knowledge here to come up with something, say, like, you know, maybe a Democrats cluster and a Republicans cluster or something that is a little bit more meaningful to humans. So you can imagine um, plenty of examples like this where, you know, if you had exactly the right representation in mind already, a machine could solve the problem. But um, you might want to get humans involved because they can kind of cluster based on features that um, you might not be able to or you might not want to take the time to kind of express yourself to the machine. So just to give um, one example of a crowd clustering technique, and there are others as well. Um, this is a work from Gomez et al. from 2011. Um, so they used a very simple technique where um, to solve a crowd clustering problem, they basically broke up their data set into, um, again, overlapping um, sets of instances, um, gave each worker some set of these instances, and asked the worker to cluster just the instances that they were given. And then, um, again, hand-waving a lot of details just to give you the basic idea, um, took all of, the, um, all of these clusters that each person came up with, fed these into some Bayesian model, and used this model to kind of aggregate everybody's um, clusters of small amounts of data into one big kind of co coherent cluster that um, you know, maximizes some objective here. So I'm, I'm being very hand-wavy. I just want to, again, um, 
my goal is more in this first half of the tutorial to give you a sense of different applications and like very um, brief glimpses into techniques that have been used rather than go into too much detail. But um, this is kind of one technique. There are others for crowd clustering as well, and this can sometimes be useful. Okay. Um, continuing on, another big use of crowdsourcing in machine learning and data mining is for um, evaluating trained models. And um, this is a use that actually comes up in the um, natural language processing community quite a lot. So um, let me give the example of um, crowdsourcing for evaluating topic models, which has been um, a kind of big area of research. Um, this is based on work of Chang et al. So um, a topic model, um, so the idea behind a topic model, if you're not familiar, is that you're going to start with some um, collection of documents, say, you know, articles from the New York Times for the past five years, something like this. And um, you want to come up with kind of a representation of um, topics where each topic is going to be a distribution over words um, that you learn. And then you can kind of classify every um, article in this data set as being a distribution over these topics that you've learned. And this kind of gives you a way of um, kind of understanding um, this big data set of text um, that can be useful for uh, getting insight into what kind of topics your data is about, um, similarities between them, and so on. These are used a lot in uh, computational, so computational social science for understanding data sets there. Um, so exam for example, you might end up with um, a topic where kind of the words with the most weight are, you know, food items like cheese, kale, bread, et cetera. You might come up with another one where the words with the highest weight are, you know, political things like election, Senate, bill, and so on. Again, each of these is really a, a distribution over words, but they're often represented by the um, highest weight words in this distribution. So, um, one kind of problem that people were facing in using topic models for things like computational social science is that, you know, if we actually want these models to be useful for um, exploration and summarization, then the topics that we get out of them need to be human interpretable. They need to be kind of things that make sense to humans, right? Like we can look at this and say, this is a topic about food, and this actually allows us to kind of meaningfully understand what's going on in the data. Um, but the problem is that, you know, it's very hard to come up with a mathematical test for whether or not something is human interpretable. And um, as we'll see, like a lot of the common tests that people were using to evaluate the quality of topic models didn't really seem to actually correlate with how useful they were to people. So um, Chang et al. came up with um, a particular test to uh, be able to evaluate kind of how interpretable a model was to humans. And they called this the word intrusion task. And the idea was that they would present a human with a list of words that are all of the most common words for some topic, but they would um, insert somewhere in this list an imposter word that um, was a common word from another topic. And their um, idea was that, you know, it should be the case that if this topic is actually interpretable, then people should be able to really easily pick out the intruder. So in this case, you should be able to look at this and tell that election doesn't really fit in with the rest of the words. And um, so somehow you can kind of equate the accuracy of workers on this type of task with um, some notion of how um, interpretable this topic is to people, right? And you could come up, you can imagine coming up with other tests like this as well. Um, and now they've turned this problem of um, evaluating uh, the quality, in this case where quality is some proxy of human interpretability of these topic models into a task that you could give to um, crowd workers. So you can basically just show a bunch of crowd workers these word intrusion tests and um, figure out kind of how interpretable these models are. And as I was mentioning, mentioning, they showed that actually like previous measures of success that have been looked at, like log likelihood on held out data, this type of thing that you can um, you know, calculate mathematically easily, don't actually imply interpretability and vice versa. So this gives kind of a, a different way of evaluating models than other things that people had done. Good. 
So let me mention just one more um, kind of direct application to a machine learning type of system. And this is the idea of human debugging, which I think is pretty creative. So this is an idea that, um, that if you have some type of you know, AI system that is actually um, trying to do a task that humans are already good, good at, so something like um, computer vision, where humans are already very good, or something like um, you know, various natural language processing tasks, then you can use humans, you can use crowd workers to kind of help debug your model and figure out um, where your system has problems. So this was first illustrated on um, the example of semantic segmentation from computer vision. And the idea of semantic segmentation is that the goal is to partition an image into semantically meaningful parts and label each part each part. So you might want to take an image like this and be able to um, extract some meaningful part of the image and label as part of the image a cat. Right. This is just the semantic segmentation task. And um, this task, it had been proposed to solve this task before using um, conditional random field models. It's not important at all to understand kind of the details of this model, but the, the important parts here are kind of you know, the, the um, algorithms that people were using to solve this problem were these kind of complicated models that were made up of many different components. So th in this case, they had this conditional random field that had a segment classifier component. Well, what did I just do? Yep. A scene classifier component, um, an object detector, and, and, so on, and so on. And all of these components individually were doing tasks that um, humans are pretty good at on their own. So the idea is that you could then use um, crowd workers to figure out in a system like this which component is the weakest link. Where do we need to sp spend more attention? And in particular, this idea that was proposed by um, Perik and Zitnik was to take this full system and individually replace each piece of it by a human or a group of humans, crowd. So um, they would first run this entire system, um, but when it got to the point where they would send something to the segment classifier, they would instead just swap out and send that piece to a crowd worker and get back um, a response from a crowd worker instead of this component. Right? And then they would look at whether doing this um, improved or hurt the overall performance of the system. And they could do the same thing for every component. And basically, by doing this, they could um, kind of figure out you know, where putting in humans helped the system the most. And um, hopefully, this would be able to tell them um, you know, which piece here was um, most in need of improvement and where they should kind of focus their attention if they want to improve the system. And um, one kind of interesting thing is that this idea was applied by um, Motagi et al. in 2013. And they found that um, on one particular component, the super segment classifier, the humans were actually less accurate than their computer system for this particular task. So if you just looked at performance of you know, this component in isolation and looked at accuracy on that, the humans appeared to be worse than their machine. But still, when they plugged in humans in place of um, their machine component, the overall system um, improved. So I think this is kind of interesting because it suggests that um, even though humans are maybe making more mistakes by some definition of accuracy, the mistakes that they're making are um, somehow better mistakes. They're mistakes of a type that are more useful to the system as a whole in this um, computer image task. So. I think this is a kind of interesting idea. I've only seen this applied to computer vision, but you could imagine it being applied to complex natural language processing systems and um, other cases where you know, you're trying to get computer performance that's as good as human performance. OK. Um, good, so that's all I want to say about direct applications to machine learning. Are there questions before I move on?
Yeah, so I don't, um, I am not a computer vision expert, so I do not have any deep insight into why this would be the case, but. I, I guess um, what's confusing me is I figure that you say whether a human is making any more mistakes by how the overall system performs. Yeah, right, so the accuracy that they're talking about here is if you just look, so if you just kind of ignore the rest of the system and just look at this one piece of it, there's kind of a right answer for that piece. We have ground truth. There's ground, yeah. And if you look at humans, they're kind of doing worse just on this piece, but still the overall system somehow improves. Yep. Does it not imply that they should need to change the metric they're optimizing for for that data? Like, they're, they're optimizing the wrong Yeah, metric. that might be exactly what it implies, but, um, you know, this is exactly, I would argue that this is exactly why this type of technique is useful, well, because it tells you, yeah, it, demonstra it, could, it could be demonstrating that they're optimizing the wrong metric. Exactly. And that's something that it's kind of, it, it's a, it would be a hard thing to get at using other types of debugging, I think, because usually people are just focused on one notion of accuracy. Okay. So continuing our um, tour of uses of crowdsourcing, let me talk a little bit about a couple of examples of hybrid intelligence systems that I think are pretty cool. Um, so the first example I want to talk about is hybrid intelligence for um, speech recognition. This is an example that I really like because I think it's um, just such a good example of a case where humans and machines are kind of being put to use doing exactly the types of things that they're each good at. So this is work from um, Lazecki et al. from 2012. And, um, they were looking at the problem of um, creating closed captions for video um, in real time on the fly. And um, now creating these closed captions is something that actually computers are really good at under ideal circumstances. So if you have you know, a speaker that you have a lot of training data from who um, doesn't have um, an accent that you're not familiar with and is not using a lot of jargon and um, there's not a lot of background noise in the room and so on, then you can actually get really good computer performance here. Um, but it's the case that, you know, especially in 2012 when they were working on this, um, if any of these conditions don't hold, you have somebody who's using a lot of jargon and maybe has an unfamiliar voice and so on, um, then computer systems are not actually that good. And um, to get a high quality result in those situations, you would need to traditionally hire a stenographer who costs a couple of hundred dollars an hour and has a specialized keyboard and all sorts of stuff like that. And so they were asking whether it would be possible to um, come up with this hybrid system that could provide real time closed captioning of kind of day to day conversations, like, you know, part of a lecture or a meeting or something else. Um, on the fly, inexpensively, without needing to go out and hire a stenographer. And um, they came up with a system which they called Scribe, which I think is pretty cool. And the idea here is that um, anybody could just start recording at any time, like on their mobile phone or other device. Um, and the speech that they are recording would be sent to a server where it would be um, immediately sent out to um, a few different crowd workers in parallel. And now none of these crowd workers would actually individually be capable of transcribing all of the speech at the same time because you know this is something that you just you need to be trained and you need a specialized keyboard and all of this to do. It's just not possible for one person to do it. But they would give the speech to um, several different people at the same time, and their system would actually kind of try to target people's attention to various parts by um, slowing down and speeding up different parts of the recording for different people. So um, in this way, they wouldn't directly tell people which parts to transcribe, but they would kind of make some parts faster or slower to target attention. Um, these transcriptions from the different workers would then be merged back together um, on another server. Uh, and either the, the merged transcription could be sent back or um, could potentially be sent to another crowd worker to quickly try to 
um, figure out if corrections were necessary. And um, the final result would be sent back to this person who was request requesting the closed captions, all within a few seconds. And doing this, they were able to get accuracy that was um, kind of much better than computer systems alone and competing well with these um, trained stenographers, but all kind of using um, untrained crowd workers. So again, it was able to kind of do this all in real time using untrained crowds to kind of outperform individuals. And um, I want to point out that this is the type of, this is an example of something where, you know, maybe it will be the case within a few years, I don't know how many years, that computer systems will be good enough that they can kind of do this task on their own. Um, but you can imagine um, other applications where, you know, computer technology is just not really good right now, and we could imagine um, inserting humans into the loop somewhere in the system to kind of make up for this and, you know, use humans as a band-aid until we can get to the point where the AI system can do everything on its own. Um, another example of a hybrid intelligence system that I like is um, the Kobe system, which is a um, community sourcing system for scheduling. So this is something that was put together um, in particular to it was in particular showcased on um, a conference scheduling problem. So um, the people who worked on this project, Kobe, are all members of the CHI community. CHI is this really big conference. The year that they tried out Kobe, there were um, 16 different parallel tracks that the organizers were trying to schedule. Um, this is a picture of the program committee, like. Uh, trying to kind of hand schedule these 16 sessions to avoid conflicts, um, which is quite a daunting task. And if you think about what they're trying to do here, they're basically trying to solve this one huge constrained optimization problem, but without actually having access to what these constraints are. I guess I shouldn't call this a, a huge constrained optimization problem. It is something that they can do by hand, but it's not a pleasant task to do by hand. And um, what do I mean by this? Well, the constraints here are really, you know, pairs of talks that should be in the same session, pairs of talks that should not be scheduled up against each other, and so on. And these are kind of constraints that different members of the community might have in their head, but they're not constraints that are expressed in any kind of nice way that they could just run an algorithm on this. So the idea of um, Kobe was that they were going to crowdsource, or in this case, community source these types of constraints so that they could better solve this big optimization problem. And so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but their system had um, a few different components. They had a committee sourcing component, an author sourcing component, an attendee sourcing component, and so on. Um, just to zoom in on one of these, the author sourcing, um, the idea here was that um, authors who had papers accepted at CHI this year were um, asked to come and um, look through this list of um, 10 papers that are similar to theirs and um, kind of rank for each of these whether it would be good in the same session or not good in the same session and so on. So they're trying to get these types of constraints from the authors. And a couple of things I want to point out about this. First is that they actually had an incredibly high response rate for this. They had 87% of the authors responding. So this is um, kind of just to say that if you're trying to use this type of crowdsourcing technique and you have a community that you can try it on that actually really cares about getting a good outcome, then this can be good for response rate. And I also want to mention that oops, um, when I say that they showed them these 10 papers that might be similar to theirs, um, the similarity was actually determined using this crowdsourced clustering um, algorithm that I mentioned earlier in the talk. So they kind of use this cloud, crowdsourced clustering as one component to figure out which papers are similar to each other, um, and then used this author sourcing component to figure out these constraints. And the final thing I want to mention about that is just that, you know, 
people might be a little bit hesitant about leaving something like conference scheduling to um, some optimization routine, but they set all of this up so that um, the chairs retain control at all time. They could go through the schedule. They could add their own constraints. They could make changes and so on. So um, nothing was really kind of left 100% to the system here, but people could step in at any time. OK. Good. So I want to talk about um, one more example of hybrid intelligence that I think is pretty cool again. And this is hybrid intelligence for writing. So um, I have to say I was a little bit skeptical when I first heard people pitching this idea of hybrid intelligence for writing. I didn't really see how this could work. But I think that um, it actually makes a lot of sense the way that they have set it up. So this is, this is work by um, Tevin et al. And um, I've seen Jamie Teven, the author of this work, talk about it. And um, she kind of likes to think about things in terms of self-sourcing first. So putting aside the crowd for a minute, you know, everybody has this experience of kind of, you know, starting to write something and looking at this empty document and not really knowing how to begin. And it's kind of much easier if you can break this kind of task into little pieces rather than just staring at a blank screen. Right? So um, the kind of self-sourcing -sour process that you might imagine for this um, might be something like this three-step process here, where you, know, you first just ask yourself, um, what type of content do I want to put in this document? Don't ask yourself to try to come up with any full paragraphs yet. Maybe just come up with a bunch of simple sentences of points that you want to make. And um, this is the kind of thing that could be done on the fly. It could be done, you know, if some idea comes to you in the shower, you could get out and write it down, and you can kind of just collect all of these things in your spare time. Um, after this content collection phase, you might go on to a phase of trying to organize content where um, you take all of these simple ideas that you've come up with, that you've come up with, and you try to label them, break them into different themes, organize them, and so on. And once you have this content organized into themes, then you can actually start thinking about turning it into writing and turning these points that you want to make into coherent paragraphs that you can kind of piece together into something bigger. Um, and so this is kind of a, a nice way of motivating yourself to get something written. But the insight that Tevin et al. had is that you know, a lot of these pieces, or some of these pieces at least, are not things that necessarily the author of the work needs to be doing themselves. Right? So you can imagine, um, instead of self-sourcing this type of process, trying to crowdsource this as well. Um, and in particular, you know, maybe you want to be coming up with this content yourself, although maybe in some scenarios you, you don't even need to be coming up with the content yourself. But you could easily imagine that for some types of writing, this part of organizing content and turning this content into actually actual paragraphs of text are things that don't necessarily need to be done by the same person. They could be um, shipped out to crowd workers. They could be um, also done maybe by traditional ML or um, AI approaches. And you can imagine kind of replacing these by some um, hybridization of crowd workers and machines and simplifying this process for yourself a lot. So that's kind of the idea behind their, um, self, their crowdsourced writing. OK. Um, and I just want to mention really quickly that the, the applications, the hybrid intelligence applications that I chose to focus on thing, here are all things that were kind of coming out of research projects, because I think these are kind of interesting. but. Um, generally, hybrid intelligence is something that gets used in industry all the time in um, you know, smaller or larger ways. Um, one example that I hear about a lot is that um, you know, Twitter does a lot with machines, but if they start sensing that there's some sort of ano anomaly, like you know, if some phrase gets used in a presidential debate and this starts um, trending and their machines don't understand what this phrase is or what's going on, then they might um, automatically like call in some humans to look at this and try to figure out what's going on for them. So there, are, this is just to say that there are tons of these little uses of hybrid intelligence in industry as well. I'm just not focusing on them here for time. Okay. Um, 
Good. So I want to go on to talk about these studies of human behavior, but do we have questions, comments before that? How are we doing? Good. Okay. Good. So the last category of kind of innovative uses of crowdsourcing that I want to talk about are these large scale studies of human behavior. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is really an area that's taking a, off a lot in um, psychology and related communities because um, people there are discovering that, you know, whereas before maybe they would put together this in-person experiment and they could get, you know, 30 subjects to come into a lab, now they can turn to crowdsourcing sites and get thousands of subjects and they can really easily iterate um, between versions of these experiments if things are not going well or they find some bug and so on. And I want to um, give just a couple of examples of more kind of computer science-y applications of um, crowdsourcing in this context because I think this is really something where, you know, it's sort of underused in computer science right now. I think there are a lot of cases where, um, you know, things that we might want to study could potentially be done with crowdsourcing. So this is just kind of to get some ideas in people's heads. Um, so the first one that I'm going to talk about is a super simple application in terms of what they actually did with the crowd. But that's kind of why I want to mention it, because there are tons of super simple things that you can do to kind of understand human behavior. Um, so this was some work that was looking at the question of um, how well internet users understand various security risks. Right. This is work by um, Ur et al. from 2016. And um, they basically, you know, we all know that there are problems out there with computer security, and they wanted to get a sense of just, um, you know, what people's perception of these various problems are, because this can, again, tell them where to kind of focus attention. And so they set up um, a couple of very simple um, crowdsourced tasks where, um, you know, on one, they would do things like um, give workers a pair of different passwords and um, ask the worker to um, decide which of these passwords they thought was more secure than the other one, right? And um, they generated passwords using kind of a, a bunch of known tricks and asked people to look at pairs and see what they thought was more secure. And then to get a sense of, you know, whether people were right or wrong um, as ground truth, they took some modern password, crack, um, password cracking software and looked at um, kind of how many passwords the software would need to check before it got to um, one of these particular passwords. And if um, it took kind of an order of magnitude or more attempts for one versus the other, they um, used that to determine which was harder to crack. So they gave people these pairs and found things like, um, you know, most people that they showed this to thought that this password on the left was more secure than this password on the right, but that's actually not the case at all. Like modern password cracking software is quite on to the fact that you might replace an A with an at sign and actually like capitalizing random letters is a more secure thing to do. Um, so they were able to just like identify things like this. Um, they also asked just some basic survey questions like, who tries to guess passwords, and they found that, you know, only 14% of the crowd workers that they asked this question to mentioned that, like, both strangers and people who you know could be risks um, of people who might try to guess a password. So um, I'm bringing this up just because, you know, they weren't actually doing anything very fancy with crowdsourcing here. They were just basically asking people simple survey questions. So this is something that's pretty easy to implement but it lets you kind of, it, it gives you a nice way of being able to survey the public about something kind of quickly and easily. Um, okay. The next user study that I want to talk about is something that's a bit um, more complicated, maybe a little bit more creative. And um, this is a study about um, kind of how we should, like what we should do to try to improve the communication of numbers in the news. And um, 
this may not seem like a very computer science-y question at first, but I think this work actually has like some interesting implications for um, online news sites and maybe being able to automatically generate things that will improve people's understanding of numbers. So this work was looking specifically at perspectives. So they were looking at you know, numbers that come up in the news, like um, say a hundred billion billion dollar cut to the US federal budget. And you know, if you just look at this number in isolation, if we say, you know, there's going to be a hundred billion dollar cut to the US budget, it's really hard to tell, you know, is this a big number, is this a small number, is this something that I should care about, is this basically nothing? Um, and so on. But the, these kind of numbers are used without any context in the news all the time. And so um, they were looking at whether people's understanding of numbers could be improved by introducing perspectives. So for example, you know, you might add in this article that $100 billion is about, you know, 3% of the 2015 US federal budget. So this kind of directly puts it into context here. Um, it's about one sixth of the annual US spending on military. Um, it happened to be about 30% of the net worth of Beyonce at the time that I was making these slides, um, and so on. You could, you could imagine coming up with all different um, types of perspective for this number that may be able to um, help people make more sense of what they're reading. Right. Um, so again, they wanted to um, understand whether good use of these perspectives could be helpful. And to do this, they um, went through kind of a, a multi-step crowdsourcing um, project. So in the first step, they were trying to just generate some good perspectives um, for news articles. Uh, so what they did was they took um, six months of New York Times front page articles. Um, they extracted 64 quotes that have some sort of measurement from these. Um, they took these 64 quotes and gave them to um, crowd workers to come up with a bunch of crowd um, generated perspectives, and here they were um, paying based on quality. Um, they then had workers uh, rate each other's perspectives for helpfulness. So they looked at, they had workers look at these different perspectives that were generated and say how good they are. This is what was used to determine how much to pay people. Um, and then for their next step of the experiment, they extracted kind of the highest rated perspectives from this phase. So they were left with perspectives that they thought were um, kind of reasonable. So just as some examples of output from this phase, they had things like, you know, the Ohio National Guard brought 33,000 gallons of drinking water to the region. You know, this is about equal to the amount of water it takes to fill two average swimming pools. So this is something that was rated a good perspective. Or, um, you know, Americans own almost 300 million firearms. This is about one firearm for every person in the United States. This is something else that was rated as a good perspective. Um, okay, so what did they do with these? Well, um, in step two, they uh, ran a bunch of randomized experiments on 3,200 subjects um, on Amazon Mechanical Turk crowdsourcing platform. Um, in which they tested three different um, proxies of comprehension. It's hard to mention, you can't really measure comprehension directly. So they looked at um, a recall measure, an estimation measure, and an error detection measure. And um, just to give kind of one example for recall, um, here they would show somebody, you know, this news with or without the perspective. They would then distract them for a few minutes, have them play a game of Tetris on the side just to kind of take their mind off of it, and then ask them to recall this number from the news article. And they found that, you know, um, across all of the different perspectives and all of the experiments, there was some benefit. So for example, you know, for the number of firearms in the US, 55% of people remembered this number with the perspective versus 40% without. So there is some benefit. And um, again, I think this is kind of an interesting study from a computer science perspective because this actually suggests a sort of um, cool hybrid intelligence system that you could imagine building where you could show people um, where, you know, if you have a news article that's going to appear on a website, you could actually kind of extract numbers from this 
go to a crowd, ask people for perspectives, um, have them, you know, look and rate perspectives to come up with a good one, and then, you know, automatically somehow show this to users as they're reading this article to give them some content. So I think that's kind of cool. Um, good. So the last example that I want to talk about of um, using crowdsourcing for um, kind of user studies is one where um, crowdsourcing was applied to um, understand the cost of annoying ads in online advertising, which is um, clearly an area that is of importance to a, a lot of big companies. So um, this work, which was by um, Goldstein et al., was um, looking particularly at banner ads. And you know that with banner ads, there are kind of some that are, you know, relatively easy to ignore, not that offensive, and um, others that are less easy to ignore, more kind of in your face, more likely to drive you away from some page that you're looking at. Um, and Goldstein et al. You know, had this observation that advertisers are paying publishers to display these ads. So yes, in some sense, the publisher is making money by showing this annoying ad. But at the same time, these ads are kind of costing publishers in terms of page views. They're kind of driving people away at the same time. And so they decided to, um, you know, they designed this crowdsourcing experiment to try to quantify somehow how much these annoying ads are actually costing publishers in dollars. Okay. So um, this was another experiment where they went through kind of multiple different crowdsourcing steps. Um, so in the first step, they use crowdsourcing in order to identify um, annoying ads. So um, here they just showed a bunch of um, different ads to crowd workers and basically treated this like a normal data labeling task where they just asked people to label these as kind of less annoying ads or more annoying ads. Um, and just to give you a sense of what came out of the first half of this, these are some examples of the ads that were um, rated kind of least annoying by crowd workers um, in this first phase of the experiment, uh, which they all seem pretty reasonable. Um, these are the ads that are rated most annoying by crowd workers. So these also seem, you know, just eyeballing it, it seems like they're getting pretty decent results from this labeling here. Um, OK, so what, what did they do? Well, once they had these ads that they had um, basically classified into good ads and bad ads, they used these in the um, second step of their experiment to figure out how much it was actually costing workers to show these bad ads. So here, um, in the second step, they had this kind of clever task design where they um, asked workers to label an email as spam or not spam. So um, over here, we have just like some text of an email from this um, standard Enron email database. But um, next to this email, when they're showing it to the workers to label, the worker um, is seeing these ads, right? And now, um, they broke their experiment into a couple of different um, treatments or conditions, where basically um, they had three different ad treatments. So either they would show um, ads that were rated good, or they would show ads that were rated bad, or they would show no ads at all. Um, and then they also had treatments paying various amounts per email. Right? And the idea was that they wanted to get a sense of kind of how much you have to, um, or you know, for different combinations of good, bad, or no ads and different payment amounts, like how many emails would people st stick around and label? Um, and yes, it was the same. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there were many different emails. People could continue going through kind of a very long, they had a large number so people could stay as long as they wanted label emails. But um, yeah, that was not varying between groups. Um, yeah, and their, their question was, how much more do we need to pay a worker to do the same task when they're shown bad ads? And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about um, exactly how their analysis works, though I recommend you look at their paper if you're interested in. But kind of some of the takeaways here were that um, good ads ended up leading to people doing about the same number of 
um, email classifications as no ads. So basically, you know, you can take away from this that publishers are probably not hurting themselves too much showing good ads compared to no ads at all. Um, on the other hand, it costs them more than about a dollar extra um, to generate a thousand views, or in this case, to um, have an extra thousand emails classified um, when they were using bad ads instead of no ads or good ads. And um, in the kind of scale of what advertisers pay for these types of banner ads, this is actually like a, a lot of money. A dollar, an extra dollar for a thousand views of an ad is actually a lot of money. And so, um, again, I'm not going into the details here, but they had this kind of interesting takeaway that, you know, you, you can argue that publishers are actually losing money by showing these bad ads, um, unless they're getting paid significantly more by the advertisers to show them than good ads, which they're likely not. So um, I thought this was a really cool study because it's using crowdsourcing to get at this question that's actually like really important for these online advertisers in a kind of clever way. Good. Um, so that is everything that I wanted to um, talk about in part one. Um, before I start the second part, just because of the way that they've time the breaks. We're going to do a little bit of part two before the break, and then we'll take a break and come back for the rest of part two. But before we um, get on to part two, are there questions about anything so far, things that you want to discuss? Anything at all? Everyone is so quiet today. Am I, am I losing you, or are you just so? Am I so clear that there are no questions at all here? I don't know which way this is going. Okay. Um, good. Okay. So let me pour myself some water and get on with the start of part two. Um, In case you're curious, we are going to do a coffee break closer to 3 o'clock because that is when the coffee will actually be available. And I want to make sure you can actually get the coffee. But we'll start part two before then. Um, and again, as I said earlier, the second part of this tutorial, now that we've kind of seen a bunch of examples of crowdsourcing and hopefully inspired you all to do lots of cool, innovative things with crowdsourcing in your own research. Um, in the second part, we're going to talk about the fact that um, this nebulous crowd is actually made up of people. And we're going to look at a bunch of experiments that have looked at things like um, what motivates crowd workers, um, both in terms of money and in terms of, in terms of intrinsic motivation. Um, we'll talk about honesty of crowd workers. Um, we'll talk about independence of crowd workers and so on. And I want to argue that um, all of this research looking at these different aspects of the crowd is actually um, important to understand if you want to um, do work in crowdsourcing. So along the way, we'll also talk about some um, various kind of best tip or best practices and tips that um, come out of this research. OK, so why? Why do we care that the crowd is made of people? Um, so let me tell you kind of first a little um, aside about why I got interested in this originally. Um, and you know, so my own research is more on the algorithmic side of machine learning. Um, I also think do a lot in algorithmic economics. Um, and I, you know, as part of this do a lot of kind of algorithm design, algorithm analysis. Um, and so this is something that, you know, we're very good at doing when we're thinking about algorithms that run on machines, right? We have all of these years of tools from traditional computer science that tell us how we can analyze things like runtime or correctness or scalability and so on when we are just like running on a machine. But more and more these days, the algorithms that we care about are not just run on machines. There are also humans in the loop in some point, right? 
maybe it's not something as complicated as these hybrid intelligence systems that I was talking about earlier. Those would be like the more extreme examples, but um, you know, any big online system is getting input from humans all the time, which is in some ways very unpredictable compared with um, computer input or computer kind of generated input. So if you want to actually be able to reason about these types of algorithms, then we need to be able to plug in some sort of model of human behavior. So we need to know, you know, basic things like, are they more or less accurate? Are they more or less honest? Um, you know, if we want to be able to reason about things like how much we should be um, paying people and how this affects their responses, we need to know things like, you know, do they respond rationally to incentives? And if and you know people can make all sorts of assumptions about these things, you know, standard rationality assumptions from economics and so on. But you know, if you're making these assumptions that aren't actually true, then these are going to end up leading to suboptimal systems. Basically, you're going to end up designing algorithms for models that aren't really true, and um, this is not very helpful. So this is kind of why I got originally really interested in kind of understanding the behavior of humans in these systems. Um, but I think it's actually something that is super important for anybody who wants to use crowdsourcing. So you know, even if you just want to use crowdsourcing to generate um, data or you know, any of these more traditional applications like evaluating a model, it's still really important. And in particular, understanding how the crowd works can teach you things like um, how much you should pay for various tasks and what type of payment structure you should use for various tasks. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it teaches you about things like how much you really need to be worrying about spam and dishonest workers, um, how and why you should be communicating with workers, um, whether these labels that you're getting are actually independent from each other or not, and generally just how to avoid a bunch of common pitfalls that people run into when they start applying crowdsourcing in their work. So I think that there are lots of um, reasons why anybody who's using crowdsourcing in their work should be interested in these things. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about in this second half. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a summary of where we're going, um, I'll start by briefly talking just a tiny bit about crowd worker demographics, though I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Um, I'll then talk about some studies of honesty of crowd workers. Uh, probably that is what we will get to before the break. And then when we come back, um, I'll talk about monetary incentives and um, some of my own work on uh, performance-based payments. Um, I'll talk about various forms of intrinsic motivation, um, including things like gamification. And um, then I'll talk about another piece of my own work, which is um, examining the fact that there that crowd workers are not actually as independent as many people believe, but there's actually um, a network of communication within the crowd. OK. Good, so this is what we're going to be covering in the rest of the tutorial. I want to uh, make a very quick aside before I get to all of that and just say a couple of words on different crowdsourcing platforms. Um, so Basically, everything that I talk about in the rest of this tutorial is going to be focused on um, Amazon Mechanical Turk. So Amazon Me Mechanical Turk is, um, for better or worse, the platform that's probably most commonly used by um, researchers who are in the United States doing work on crowdsourcing. Um, it's difficult for people to use outside of the United States. So um, I'll mention a couple of alternatives that um, are also used in research a lot, but I'm going to be talking, most of the studies that I'll be talking about are focused on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and I think a lot of the results kind of generalize. So on this platform, um, just at a very high level, we have kind of two types of people who come along. We have requesters, who would be like you, the researcher, um, who come and post descriptions of their tasks along with um, the amount of money that they're willing to pay for this task. Um, we then have workers who can come and um, browse all of these available tasks, choose which ones they want to do, and um, complete them for money, basically, basic idea. Um, and Amazon Mechanical Turk is largely focused on uh, micro tasks, so these would be things like labeling an image or completing 
a survey or um, other fairly short types of tasks. Um, even though we're going to be focusing on this for most of the rest of the um, tutorial, I just want to very quickly mention some alternatives because I get asked about this a lot. Um, so, and there are many, I'm just going to mention a few of the more popular ones. Um, so Crowdflower is um, an alternative that people turn to a lot that is especially useful um, for businesses that have kind of AI or data mining related needs. So they have a lot of um, kind of specialized tools that are targeted at enterprise um, customers. So these tools make it really easy for um, companies to come and use crowdsourcing for things like search relevance evaluation, sentiment analysis, data classification, and other kind of common needs of companies that do a lot of AI. Um, another alternative that uh, I believe is uh, rather popular in Europe with people who don't have easy access to Mechanical Turk is um, Clickworker. This is a German platform where a lot of the workers are um, European. And they also have some support built in for common tasks like um, translation and web research. And they have um, a nice mobile crowdsourcing interface as well. Um, just to mention two more alternatives people might be interested in. Um, Prolific Academic is a newer platform. It's a UK-based platform. And their primary focus is on um, researchers, primarily in the psychology community, who want to be connected with um, subjects for running experiments. So they're really primarily set up for people who want to run um, behavioral experiments using crowdsourcing. Um, and finally, I just want to mention um, Upwork, which is a little bit different from the others that I mentioned. Um, which instead of being one of these micro task platforms for um, shorter term tasks is more of a marketplace for freelancers for larger jobs. So um, this is a crowdsourcing site you might go to if you have larger jobs like, you know, designing a website or writing an article or things that take more time and also potentially require um, more specialized talents than some of the others. Um, so I just wanted to kind of mention that as an aside because I get asked, asked about other crowdsourcing platforms a lot, but we're going to be focusing mostly on Mechanical Turk. Again. Um, good. So let me say a couple of words on crowdworker demographics. Um, and these demographics are all things that I pulled from this tool called um, MTurk Tracker that came out of a group at NYU. And um, the idea behind MTurk Tracker is that rather than just look at demographics at any one particular point in time, they have um, this um, tool set, set up that automatically um, every day puts out a new batch of um, surveys on Mechanical Turk. And workers are allowed to do surveys something like once a month or something like this. Um, so they're not just getting the same people every day. Um, and they, by kind of putting out more and more of these surveys every day, they're trying to get like a sort of continuous view of what the demographics on Mechanical Turk look like at any particular point in time and how they're changing. Um, I will say there are a couple of flaws in trying to get demographic information this way. Um, I think the, the biggest one is that um, a lot of Mechanical Turk workers do kind of specialize the type of tasks that they do. So, you know, there are particular workers who really like labeling data. There are particular workers who very, who like you know, doing behavioral experiments, and there are other workers who really like taking surveys. So, you know, it could be the case that this is more demographic information about the population of workers who really like taking surveys. But um, I will say that the estimates that they're getting are really not that far off from other estimates that I've seen. So I think they're, you know, more or less pretty accurate. Um, so just to name a couple of highlight or mention a couple of highlights here. Um, in terms of where these workers are coming from on Mechanical Turk, about um, 70 to 80% of workers at any given time are from the US, about 10 to 20% from India. Um, it's actually not that surprising that workers are mostly from these two countries because Mechanical Turk will allow you to either be paid in US dollars or um, Indian currency or Amazon credit. So 
it's kind of a, a better deal for workers to be coming from these areas. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, the demographics, this particular, these particular numbers will be very different for the other crowd, crowdsourcing sites, and you know, in particular, the ones that focus more on European workers. But there are very few European workers on Mechanical Trick. Um, of these workers, there's roughly an equal gender split. Um, if you look at the median self-reported household income, um, this tends to be around forty to sixty thousand dollars a year for U.S. workers, which is actually pretty much in line with the general population. The median income for the U.S. as a whole is somewhere in this range, so it's not that far off. Um, it tends to be uh, significantly less for Indian workers. The median is less than 15,000, and a lot of Indian workers make $10,000 or less a year. Um, and the, the main thing I want to call out here is that there can also you know, be big changes in these demographics based on time of day, which again, you know, shouldn't be that surprising because we do have time zones, different people are awake during different times of day. Um, but I, I want to call this out because um, I think a, a mistake that a lot of people make early on when they're um, using crowdsourcing for the first time is to not really think about the time of day that they're posting a task. And you know, if you post something at two in the morning, you're likely going to be getting many more Indian workers than if you post it during like, business hours in the US. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, okay. So that's kind of all I wanted to say about demographics, just to give you a rough sense. And yes? How, how much paying workers are do a living out of that? Say that again? How, how much they are paid? How, how, the other worker, how much is our workers money? paid? Um, so a little bit later, I will come back to that and talk about um, kind of rules of thumb for how much I think workers should be getting paid, but there is a lot of variance there. And also when they've surveyed workers to figure out kind of how much different workers are making hourly, this can vary really dramatically where some workers are able to make pretty good income by um, kind of optimizing, you know, people, workers who are on Mechanical Turk to make money and are on for many hours a week have a lot of ways of kind of optimizing to um, find the best tasks that pay a lot of money quickly, accept lots of these tasks, kind of have many things going on at the same time, and they can actually make a pretty decent wage that way. Um, I think it's much less for people who just come on occasionally and browse for tasks and um, don't have a system worked out. Um, but I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit later about paying workers, and the general recommendation in the research community these days is um, to try to pay at least like US minimum wage per hour. So, so there are opportunities to make money. OK. So um, let me get on to this question that um, I think a lot of people have about workers, which is, you know, are all of these workers just dishonest? Are they all trying to kind of scam requesters out of lots of money? Um, I talk about a, a couple of different experiments that have tried to answer this question. Um, in different ways and what we can kind of take away from these. So uh, the first experiment that I'm going to talk about here is um, something that was done by Surrey et al. in 2011. Um, and this was actually, their design was actually built, um, it, it was actually kind of copying a, an experiment from behavioral economics that had done pre, been done previously in a lab setting, but they were applying it specifically to look at workers on Mechanical Turk. So um, in their experiment, they um, gave workers um, a survey where they just asked them a bunch of demographic questions. This was not really the point of the experiment, but this was just you know, the first part of the task that they completed, um, basic survey. Um, and at the end, after workers had completed the survey, um, they asked them to uh, privately roll a die. And they told them, you know, if you don't have a die handy, you can go to this external website, which we do not control, and you can simulate rolling a die. Um, and they asked them to report the outcome of this die roll, so, you know, a number one to six. And then the payment that they gave the worker was 25 cents plus 25 cents times their roll. So, you know, if you 
rolled a three on the die and reported this, then you would get 75 cents for your roll plus 25 cents or a dollar total, right? And um, they made it very clear, again, that you know, they could be doing this on their own, with their own die at home. They could be doing this on this external website however they wanted. Um, and you know, the idea here is that we can't say anything about whether any particular worker is telling the truth or not, because you know, their role could have just as likely been anything. But if you have a large population here, then you know that the mean role that is reported should be pretty close to 3.5 just by statistics. So you can kind of get this group measure of how honest the population of people are being, right? So, okay, it should be 3.5. What do you think the mean was? It's a test of how honest people think crowd workers are. Five. Other guesses? So there was some dishonesty. It's not quite as bad as uh, people here seem to think. Um, the average role they found in this experiment that was reported was 3.91. So um, this is a histogram of the proportion of people who reported every role. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, if everybody reported truthfully, then these should all be like just about at this red line. But you can see that you know, a significant fraction of people are misreporting ones and twos, overreporting fours and fives. Um, it's not statistically significant, but there are actually seem to be more people misreporting five than six, which is kind of interesting. It makes you wonder if people like think that somehow five looks more honest or something like this. Is there a question? Yeah. Yeah, so everything I've talked about so far was just one flip per user. Uh -huh. So there's nothing you can tell about an individual. But I will get to something related to that in a second. Yes? What's the point of the translation like into money, into like a payment, as opposed to just asking what the, which role? Well, the point is that if you're not translating it into money, then there's no incentive to lie, right? Like if you're just. Oh, oh they're actually getting paid the amount? That yeah. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is their payment for the task. So basically, you know, there's absolutely nothing stopping someone from just reporting a six and getting the maximal payment. And you could never detect that this person was lying, right? Can you go one second with this slide? Uh, yeah. So from my experience, if you switch in the experiment from the time, the, the, second, the first question to the second, the subject are completely different because uh, if I say that I Oh, interesting. So you think that people would lie more if they asked them the demographic questions after? Hmm. Yeah, could be. Um, yeah, so even, you know, even in this case, I mean, this doesn't, if you just look at this picture, it doesn't seem like a huge amount of dishonesty. But if you look like more than a third of people who rolled two are probably misreporting this up. So this is actually, you know, somewhat significant, although I don't know, maybe not that bad considering everyone could have just reported six. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, but again, you know, many workers here were honest, even though they didn't have to be. Um, and I will say, um, as I mentioned, the authors of this work designed this study um, to kind of mimic a lab study that had been done um, by some behavioral economists. And the results that they found on Mechanical Turk were like extremely similar to the results that were found in this lab study. So um, this is saying, you know, workers on Mechanical Turk are maybe dishonest, but about the same as I don't know who was in this study, Psych 101 students or you know whatever portion of the population they're getting to do these in-person studies. So it's not kind of just something bad about Mechanical Turk workers. Um, going back to uh, this question that was asked a minute ago, um, the authors then tried the same thing, but having people report 30 roles instead of um, just an individual role, um, with the idea being that you know if you're just reporting one role, there's no way of telling if an individual is being honest. But if you're reporting 30 roles, then um, we have some way of kind of 
you know, being able to detect it. Um, and they found that indeed in this case, when they asked people to um, report the um, outcome of 30 rolls, there was a lot less dishonesty. So here again is the histogram of the number of one, twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes that are reported. And um, there is some underreporting of ones going on, a little bit of overreporting of fours, fives, and sixes, but um, you know, it's much less than in the case where they ask people to only report one. Um, in this case, the mean was 3.57, which is a lot closer to the expected 3.5. Um, and encouragingly, they found that only three out of um, a total of 232 subjects reported a sequence of roles that was um, like significantly statistically unlikely. And actually, only one of these 232 people reported a sequence of um, 60 sixes or 30 sixes. So I guess that's good. Um, so yes, great. So we could speculate about why this is the case, but um, you know, we have no way of knowing for sure why people were reporting, um, why people were misreporting less in this case, but it seems like you know, there is some fear of getting caught here that is maybe leading people to be honest when they think that they could be found out. Um, so the last thing I want to mention about um, honesty is another study that um, was looking at kind of dishonesty in a different context on Mechanical Turk. And I think this one's interesting because it, sh it shows that, you know, even small amounts of dishonesty can kind of add up and be problematic. Um, and so this is some work that was looking at um, dishonesty specifically in the context of um, kind of pre-processing questions that workers were asked to determine whether or not they would be qualified for um, an additional task, so kind of pre-screening questions. And in particular, um, these authors, Chandler and Palachi, um, asked workers, are you the parent or guardian of a child with autism? And um, they did this in a couple of different conditions. So um, in one treatment, they just asked workers this with no additional context given for why they were asking them. Um, and in this case, about 4% of participants said yes. Um, I will point out that you know, we have no way of knowing whether or not these people are actually telling the truth, and I suspect that that's actually like a little bit high, so maybe there's some amount of dishonesty going on here already. But um, these people you know, were not given any reason to believe that it would help them to be dishonest here. Um, in their uh, second random treatment, they told workers that um, the answer to this question was going to be used um, as pre-screening to determine whether they were um, eligible for an additional task where they could you know, come and make more money. And in that case, when they told people it was a pre-screening test, then closer to 8% of participants ans answered the question yes. And so again, we don't know what the actual truth in the population is, but we can see that you know, a lot more people are saying yes when they're told that this is a pre-screening test as opposed to when they're just kind of asked this question with no obvious motivation for lying about it. Um, and I, I think that this is interesting because it points out that, um, you know, first of all, you, you need to be careful about, you know, giving people a lot of motivation to be dishonest because, you know, if you can, if you can pre-screen in a way that's not obviously giving people a lot of way to lie to you, or a lot of motivation to lie to you, that would be better. Um, I also think it's interesting because like this seems like a really small difference. You know, in particular, if we just make the assumption that everybody in this control treatment was telling the truth, which is not necessarily true, but if we just you know assume that maybe around four percent of people um, actually are the parent or guardian of a child with autism, then um, this is not actually that huge of a fraction of people who are being dishonest in the second case, it's, you know, 3.5% of the population. But if this is actually used for pre-screening, you can see that this actually leads to a huge problem, right? Because now we're just taking 
this 8% of the um, population who said yes, we're filtering those people into another experiment. And actually, like of that 8%, a large fraction of them are um, being dishonest. So even if it's even if in the overall population, it's just a small fraction of people who are being dishonest, it actually still leads to kind of a, a large fraction of um, imposters in the subsequent study. So, um, you know, some care needs to be taken with these types of things. So just to kind of summarize um, what we've talked about with respect to honesty, um, different people might interpret this differently, but my interpretation here is that most workers are going to be honest most of the time, especially if we kind of don't do things that intentionally lead them astray and give them this obvious motivation to um, lie. Um, but of course, some are not. And it's still important to use care to um, avoid these types of attacks. Of, of attacks. Um, and in particular, it's really important to use extra care when you might be either intentionally or inadvertently giving people motivation to be dishonest. And this means that you, know, you should especially take extra care with things like pre-screening. Um, ideally, you make it part of a separate task. Don't make it entirely clear that this is what you're doing, and so on. And um, this paper that that result came from has some additional tips for pre-screening, if people are interested in that in particular. Um, good. So uh, that is all I wanted to say about um, honesty. I think this is actually a pretty good stopping point where we are in the slide. So if people have questions now or things that you want to talk about before we go to coffee break, now would be a good time. Yeah. Um, that is a standard technique. People actually do that type of thing in crowdsourcing a lot for, um, you know, especially for these types of simple labeling tasks. Like it, it's quite common in labeling tasks for people to occasionally insert some questions that they know the answer to because it's so easy to do that. And you can kind of. Um, yeah, you can just toss out people, or you can either you know tell them that you're kicking them out, or you can just ignore their data later if they're getting things wrong. And people put in all sorts of other um, types of traps like that too. Like I've seen um, examples where you know people will insert somewhere in their instructions a sentence that's like when you get to the bottom of this page, ignore everything it says and just hit cancel or something. And then, you know, if people haven't read the instructions carefully, they won't know to do this and they'll get tossed out. Um, but at least some of the work that I've seen that has actually looked at the effectiveness of techniques like this, and I wish that I could remember the reference off the top of my head, but I can't. But it, there has been, you know, at least one study looking at um, these types of things that has found that it doesn't actually improve quality that much and that, um, a lot of crowd workers are kind of, you know, pretty good at this point in spotting these types of tricks, and you know, they'll kind of pay enough attention to get around these types of things um, if they really want to get around them. Maybe for web surveys, they might have a bit of an experienced crowdsourcing tool. Maybe. Yeah, but it does help somewhat, and you, and you know. Having these kind of um, throwing in the occasional problem that you know the answer to can help like filter out bots and things like that too. So it's kind of, it can still be useful in some cases. But um, I guess I would just say I wouldn't assume that just because people have passed some you know clever test in your instructions that they're actually going to do a good job at the task. Like it may be that they're just good at spotting these types of tests.